All right, welcome everyone to the KCP community meeting, January 18, uh, 2024. Uh, still getting used to that. Um, this meeting is governed by the CNCF Code of Conduct, which boils down to let's be excellent to each other. Um, so we will try to do that. Okay, um, we have a couple of uh, agenda items. I added some of them, so I will start just talking about them. Uh, since Kubernetes 1.29 is out, I wanted to talk about rebasing to that. Um, if it makes sense, if you want to do it. Um, I'm not sure what kind of changes were upstreamed or if any changes were upstreamed in that release cycle. Um, I don't have a full overview of that. So. Is anyone? Yeah, it's basically my big branch PR. Where is it? Um, I can share in a second. So basically, that's a that's uh, the base for everything in KCP as well. So KCP changes are not so big, but we have to update that branch. It's cute, it's not. Um, so first of all, it's this one, the revert of the revert. This is the CAD PR from Andy, which got reverted and I think Jordan is basically fine with it, but he had some questions about performance. I mean, not doubts, but just um, he was asking for for proofs uh, or some arguments why this is good to merge. This is something anybody could pick up basically and try to answer Jordan's requests. Okay, but yeah, this second last second last comment. Yeah, no, but this is like not merged yet, right? So for in one dot twenty nine rebase, it doesn't have any significance. Um, it's a good question. It might be pretty current, but I I, I would just try to rebase that PR. I mean, I in a general form, not myself necessarily. So this one must be rebased. Maybe it's easy. Maybe it's, it's what you say that there's not much work to do. And this is second PR. But that is one which is at the bottom of KCP of our core fork. The other one. It's the second one. And I think this is on top of the other in KCP. It says depends on the other one, yeah. Yeah. So I would, I mean, if you have, if you have time for, for trying the rebase, look at those two PRs and try to try to get them rebased on the latest main branch, master branch. Okay, that must be rebased. There's one conflict at least. The other one is a clean, the first one, the CID one. Nearly clean. Just one final. Okay, there are just two conflicts in, in the, the, the big PR, so this looks not too bad. But this now we're targeting 130. Yeah. Okay, target is 130. Okay, so the the question is is like it would would it make sense to just skip one to twenty nine, like rebasing everything in KK uh, sorry, in KCP yeah. to one to twenty nine? Doesn't make much sense if we're waiting for these changes to land. Yeah, if there's no no urgent reason, I think we can skip it. Okay. Nevertheless, those two PRs we have to invest time there. Okay. This is uh, those are the ones which make most work. Um, if those get in, especially the CID one, 
So technically, the, the CID one from ND, it's the factoring we, we base our changes on, but I think it was motivated by conversion at the time. So conversion by CL, you remember there was a prototype and I think we ripped it out because it's not, I mean, it's not really KCP, right? It's just, it happened to be in KCP, but it's not really coupled. I so think I remember. also, yeah, it, maybe it's possible to get to, I mean, if we don't get this merged and we don't have time to, to answer Jordan's question, could be that just skipping that and rebasing basically our code onto 129 or 130, whatever, but without those changes. Just an idea. Um, yeah, that, that that makes sense. Like, if we don't get it in into one dot thirty, I guess um, it's still it like it makes sense to do rebase just for housekeeping and for keeping up with upstream. Um, but if we get the yeah. changes in, we have even more like motivation to to do that. Yeah. Looking on John's comments, um, I think it's mostly about somehow proving that it's correct and doesn't regress in any way, like that's not performance regression. It's doable, yeah, that's, but still needs, needs time. That's the main question, like how, how would one goes about proving his concerns? So the, if I remember right, there was, was his name, a safe and unsafe converter or something like that. And I think the PR from Andy introduced some deep copy, remember right? And my, I, I think, I think I, I had the idea or the, the insight that actually this unsafe thing, well, I think it was safe, the safe uh, code pass, which does lots of deep copy is not even necessary. So there is this more work possible on top, which makes it pretty much obvious that it's faster. Yeah, but my memory is not really clear about that. I have to really read it again. So. Okay. So I don't know. Essentially, I'll be honest. This is way over my head. I mean, like, I don't think even if I would want, I would be able to help with this one. It's a bit poking the bear. Like, I, it's, uh, it would require extensive, like, looking into, okay, what is this actually? What part of the code is this actually? It's, it's an interesting challenge. Um, but I, guess the reality is this is going to be like on best effort um just if someone takes a stab at it they should coordinate yeah i, I will have some long flights soon so maybe i use one of them because this is really a deep topic where you need i know a day or so really it's only without any disturbance maybe i try that Yeah, it's deep. It's deep in the API server, in the CLD API server, especially. It, it, it's fascinating, that's for sure. I'm not sure it's the right word, but. Uh, no, <laughs> no, no. I, I, I generally mean that. Like, it's uh, the internals. I, I would like to, to brush up on those. But yeah, okay. That sounds good. Just like whoever like actually ends up taking a look. Um, uh, Otherwise, yeah, as you say, let's skip 129, right? Yeah. Then I think that has exhausted the 129 situation. Um, I wanted to ask what everyone's feelings are about the KCP 0.22 release. I think it makes sense to frequently release so we get out the changes that we have. I'm not sure we had that many 
changes. I don't think we had a rebase since the last release. I'm not sure, actually. Uh, Christoph, you have your hand up. Yeah, sorry. Hi, everyone. Um, so I just tried to rebase the first PR, the CRD conversion, and it's just one single conflict in the import statement. So that's basically a trivial rebase to do. Uh, how, how would we go about, should I just push this into my fork and you, Stefan, pull them for me? I mean, if it's just an import, I can just do it in my branch and I push it, right? Okay, probably, yeah. Um, but I probably can't. And this was on, onto 129 or onto main? Onto master? Onto master. Onto master. Yeah. But it will be the same for 129, probably. Yeah. And this was a CAD one, right? Yeah. Maybe try the big one as well. Maybe it's as simple because there's, there's just one more file, so it yep. could be easy. Good try. Thanks, Marvin. Back to you. Yeah. Yes. Uh, back to a possible KCP release. Um, so I was thinking about that, like doing it maybe after the QL net is 1.29 rebase, but since we have decided to skip that, I think such a release would, at the moment at least, mainly include a few, let's say, operational goodies, like some efforts to get rid of the admin cube config that is being written, or at least make it optional. Like I think it's now hit behind the battery. Um, so that would make Kubernetes deployments easier, like deploying KCP on Kubernetes and these kind of things. Question is, does that warrant a release? Um, do we want to set a milestone up for, for that release? Like, what do we want to have in? Um, I personally feel like it's a good idea to release once in a while uh, to, to show movement in the project. I think it has a memory leak fix too. And I think that one alone kind of counts for the release already. That's a good point. I think we can release it, to be honest. It's a cheap thing to do. Okay. Then, then we do it, but when the, the bullet, then we do that. So um, I think both Stefan and MJ, you basically know which, uh, which levers to pull, which buttons to press, right? That is quite extensive document in our Git repo. So like I could go through the release process, but I did, I think last two, if you want to go through the, that one and basically we can coordinate offline just to know where the levers are. Um, yeah, I was going to say, um, if there's someone else who wants to do the release, I would love to defer, but I am I would be up for doing the release. So we, uh, I mean, it's great that we have it documented, um, but like everyone getting some practice in releasing is probably a good idea. Okay. Is is that a decision? <laughs> um, does does everyone agree with, with cutting a release? Yeah, I think let's do that. I still have few PRs which I want to get in, but the amount of time I have, I think they're gonna slip. So let's just release it if need. We can release one more time. Okay. Then then let's do that. Great. Then, uh, yeah, plenty of top, uh, topics today. I had a topic that I am not sure if we, oh, Andy, yes. Oh, you didn't have to call on me right away. I was just getting in queue. <laughs> hey, everybody. All right. Hey, I hear a lot of talk about batteries. I don't know what that is. Can somebody explain what a battery is? Um, I think, it, so, so, so it's, a, it's a flag on the KCP binary. Um, and the batteries are, I think, mostly the idea was that you can enable some optional features that I... mostly make it easier to run KCP as a developer on your local system. Um, but in general, it's like optional features in KCP. Great, makes better sense. Thank you. 
like it, it I think a lot of them are bootstrapping uh, like default cluster workspace types or do, like yeah so it's it's basically just ease of usage if you can go with something that is prefabricated okay okay then um I don't remember who I had that conversation with and on which channel <laughs> uh, but um um so I remember that at some point KCP changed the way that Airbug across uh, or like the the Airbug to access a workspace to be allowed to like, basically get into a workspace changed uh, at some point it was in the parent workspace um, and because of sharding considerations that changed to permissions within the workspace. So you had to have a, uh, you had to have Airbug in within the workspace, not uh, like outside of it. Um, and I've been thinking about how to scale Airbug, especially across workspaces. Um, and I feel like, or like the most simple solution that I came across was that and this is like an idea that I wanted to run by everyone. Um, basically, cluster roles and cluster role bindings could have a label or an annotation or whatever that basically just syncs it to the downstream to, like, to the child workspaces. Um, so basically, what you have in the in the in the parent workspace could optionally like it like it's not it's not something that is done per default, but if you want your permissions to propagate through the workspace tree, uh, you like label your cluster role and cluster role binding accordingly, and it just gets copied essentially into the workspaces. That, from my understanding, would solve the sharding problem, um, because then you like, it, like if one of the shards down at the time of the sync well okay then it can't be synced but apart from that it would be like an independent sync so the parent workspaces need to be up and available um after the sync has finished yeah, this, what... this would work i think I think why we we didn't really I mean if we want to build something in KCP which is really just a controller or something I think what you describe is basically a solution. Um, the alternative is to have a distributed uh, system which does authorization on top via webhook. So for example, you could use something like a Zanzibar based system, Open FGA or whatever or set something like that and basically model the, the workspaces with relations and via that mechanism um, distribute or inherit uh, permissions so if you have a I mean in, in a bigger setup probably that's a, a better solution because in the small setup a controller would do it as well yep yeah. I mean yeah there, there are like much much more sophisticated solutions for sure um i've been like trying to think about this like rather simple one and then you like don't move outside of of like kubernetes airbag um i i guess the question that i mostly have is is this something that we would be interested within kcp itself like you can i think pretty easily write it as a standalone controller or you can have or we can have it in kcp itself or maybe we find a middle ground where it's a project in the KCP dev organization, but it's a standalone thing that you can deploy. Um, basically, the question is how useful would this be to the, um, let's say, to, to the community? MJ. So just step back. So what, what problem are you trying to solve? Like, why do you need this? What use case do you have for the airbag syncing? Well, one of the examples that um, that I encountered is that even though I, for example, I'm a cluster admin in the root workspace of KCP, and unless I fail to find it, I cannot gain access to workspaces created by someone else in the root workspace. Like I'm sort of this like, 
let's say, super admin, but there's no way to assign you permissions to basically access child workspaces from within that workspace. So but you're not an admin. So we have a, what's the name? MJ, maybe you remember. There's a in system master. There is a, a role binding, I think, which could give one that permission. Yeah, but this is automatically by, the deployed. Admin, by the cluster admin, you mean you are like Kubernetes cluster admin, not any of those privileged KCP groups, any of those. Yeah, like, like, like the cluster dash admin cluster role, yeah. And there's something KCP admin also should be. Yeah, there is and a separate one, permission. system KCP yeah. admins. Or admin, something like that. Yeah. Being a KCP admin gives you access to all workspaces. Like, it doesn't matter what RX is there inside the workspace. It gives you cluster what admin I... everywhere, basically. Yeah, your cluster admin in every logical cluster, every workspace. Yeah, what I would like to try to avoid is like hard code any group memberships. Like if someone is in the system master system masters group, they will be there, you know, sort of forever. At least if you have if you like give them a cert or something, um, yeah, or, or something like that. That's also is it, is that a group or a cluster role, MJ? Do you know? Uh, it's a cluster. I think role. That's a group. It's a group actually. Okay. No, wait one second. So it's it's a group and there's a cluster yeah. all binding binding to multiple things. Yeah, so like the the gist of my problem is I want to make air bug management in KCP somewhat scalable. Um another situation that I could think of is uh, you create an API export for your API. You you deploy your controller um, that is supposed to reconcile that, like the the API that is set up by this API export. That means it will connect to the virtual workspace for that API export, but then it will still need permissions in all the all the workspaces that binds that API export. So if you if you set up something at the top where the API binding lives and you propagate it down, you would be able to give these permissions automatically without like going nicely to the workspace owner and saying, hey, can you also give this person or this, this like identity permissions? And and maybe there's another way to do this. Maybe I, I missed something, but I think except for hard coding these super admin groups into the identity i i don't feel like there's a way at the moment i la, la, your last statement about api bindings and having access to workspace it didn't sound right to me okay okay so so maybe this is a misunderstanding on my side but um let, let me try to, to walk you through the process so i create an api export let's say in the root workspace um, that means I, I'm getting a virtual workspace for that particular API export, like when someone binds to that, but that, that's details that we don't need to care about. And I want to deploy a controller that is allowed to basically reconcile resources in that API, because that's like the whole point, right? You just deploy an API that does nothing, um, that, that's not really what you want to do. So you need the controller. And that controller will connect to the virtual workspace. Yeah. But Which... from my experience, I mean, this is a misunderstanding, but I, it, it seems to me that if you go through the virtual workspace, you will still be bound by the airbag permissions of the, let's say, original workspace that you're trying to access. So for example, if you're trying to create, oh, sorry, workspaces, um, if you if you try to create a resource, oh no, sorry, if you try to read a resource in someone's workspace in the consumer workspace, so I, I have a I have a child workspace somewhere below the root workspace. I create an API binding and I create a resource from that API. 
and that will show up in the virtual workspace for the API export. But I like my, my controller needs enough permissions to access that object. It, it has permissions for your resource, the one you own, like the one you exported. So you can, without having access explicitly to the workspace, you can do those things. You cannot access other things. If you want to access other things, you need those um, permission claims. Yeah, no, 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 I, I, I know that. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I think I'm, I might not be making a lot of sense. Um, so if, if I connect to the virtual workspace, um, I don't become magically like super admin, right? The virtual workspace is not a like tightly guarded secret. It's like an URL that you can kind of construct from logic. But if I go through the virtual workspace, Oh, no, 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 there's a, there's a Airbag permission for the export. You can construct the URL, but just by that, you don't get access. There's a subject access review against, I mean, conceptually against your export workspace. And this gives you the permission to see your objects everywhere, basically. Uh -huh. This might be missing for you. OK. Um yeah if we get it right the api api export sits in a workspace so if you are a cluster admin of that particular workspace you should be able to interact with the, the virtual workspaces of that export or you can scope it down to that particular api export i, I think that that's what stefan meant yeah okay okay then yeah maybe maybe i need to go back and then see what that exactly is um and and this is very similar to what we had a chat offline about service accounts, where in my example, I I created a service account in the workspace, which has an API export. I gave the service account a cluster admin and gave constructed a cube config basically for that API export. And that fails to watch anything what's in the second in the different shards except the original workspace because if using service account airbag thing it goes through the service account airbag thingy which basically checks if the secret and service account exists within the shard on the watches and this is where marvin we said like basically it should be potentially certificate controller should be run under certificate based identity not service account identity because of the these objects so maybe if but, you have um, but this is about authentication right so service account authentication yes. doesn't work marvin's case i think it's about the authorization, authorization yeah. you have a user which is known right but it doesn't have the permissions you expect no, and no. you have to give those. I think it's a, it's a custom resource. I mean, a, a resource, sub resource, maybe slash content or something like that. So export name slash content could be. Okay, that, then that, that that solves a lot of my like that solves one of my use cases. Absolutely, thank you. I I, I wasn't aware. Um, I think then my use case boils down to. It would be nice if the owner of an organizational workspace would automatic or would be able to to gain access to workspaces created in their organization without having to ask the people that originally created it. I think that's kind of what my use case boils down. And Christoph, you can maybe add something. No, I had another question. Uh, I was under the impression that virtual workspaces are kind of read only. Uh, that's probably wrong, right? No, yeah. that's okay. wrong. Okay. I always thought that you only read and get a view, basically, of the system via the virtual workspace. But if you wanted to patch an object or update an object, you would have to explicitly connect to the workspace that the object is in and then do your operations. But then I must have gotten that wrong somewhere. OK, good. That clears it up. That's, yeah. Cool. Okay. Maybe I don't like we're spending already quite a lot of time on this topic. I didn't mean to go into that much detail because MJ has a update slash demo for us. So that sounds pretty cool. 
Um, I think the gist is the idea that I had doesn't sound completely outlandish to the people on the call, which is nice. So I will probably work on a prototype and maybe I can show it here again and then we can see, okay, is this something we want to have in KCP or is the use case like weak enough that it doesn't need to be part of the core feature set? I would just wonder. It would be nice if this, if this can be implemented outside. Okay. Just that fact would be worth it to, I mean, to, to try it and where it then lives, that's a different question. Okay. Just to close your API, API export and binding uh, question, oh, yeah. let's not ruin out that there might be some bugs lurking out and what you're trying should be working but isn't and you're trying to work around something. I will be trying to do something similar in the next two weeks. So let's sync offline. We can basically sync our notes and see if stuff works or doesn't. But what you're saying, it should be working basically. Yep, the, the, there is also a chance that I am misremembering and I actually was interacting with a virtual workspace that we wrote. So that of course is not covered by this kind of stuff. So I might be like completely off base here and basically it was our fault. Anyway, I think that might wrap up nicely this topic unless there's something else to talk about. I was just wondering if this RBAC synker is specific to RBAC resources, or if this is just a generic syncing tool that syncs objects down in child workspaces. And I was wondering if the sync is always recursive, or if you somehow need to control the depth that you want to re like sync something down. But that goes probably into too much detail here. But you know, if you sync RBAC resources, why not sync any resource? Yeah, maybe, maybe let's take that offline. It's an interesting thought for sure. Okay, uh, MJ, you have an update on sharding. So I'll give you the stage. Okay, so let me try to share my screen and see if... Can you see it? So there was a huge PR in the Helm charts, and it ended up basically from the conversations where uh, we're thinking of doing something pre production launch of a KCP based service. But we stepped back because we we had an idea that it should be launched as a sharded immediately just because operating in non-sharded and sharded models is a bit different different cases so what i have here is uh, is basically a representation of that helm charts pr where it boosts up the initial shard, shard and adds a second shard so we can create a, a location selector will name equals beta or select will through which basically targets the particular particular shards in those in that area in those ones the idea is what i trying to push is i think in general we should try to move to the pattern where we always use everywhere shards just because uh, amount of coding mistakes and issues i found out in my code which was running in non-sharded well move to sharded one is like it's a quite big one and there's some different models which comes into play as already mentioned like service account authentication which doesn't work some of the how you access the virtual workspaces doesn't work example um, yes 
proxy. Like the fact like that you need now to run multiple controllers pointing to multiple these things, which were not accounted basically an example in the code I wrote. So I'm just thinking that for a local development, maybe we stay how it is now, but for the Helm charts, I would be willing if we try to start pushing for more, default is sharded and try use that just because it's just easier of easier to move code when it's done right in the first place than after the fact. So I just wanted basically to share where it is now. PR is still a bit in a in a raw state because I'm quite changing a lot. But the idea is that everything is bring it your own. Like if you generate your certificates somewhat differently, you can bring them in and you deploy every component separately, like proxy, shards, cache server, et cetera, et cetera. That's just short show and tell. I'm not sure what people think about that. I mean, it looks great. It's great that sh uh, the sharding is, is, uh, is working. Um, And I lost my train of thought. Sorry, I think Stefan, you also wanted to say something. I think it's a good idea for the reasons you, you gave. Like, it's easy to make assumptions about single shards accidentally, and then it doesn't work. So, yeah, and I did plenty, and like some. It took half of the, like a lot of code needs to be rewritten. So I'm just thinking that if somebody on board the journey of building something on top of that, I would strongly encourage to start building Bive multiple shards, even in the same cluster, same location, just to have this paradigm in your head, in your code, how everything is wired together. So just just good right the idea would basically be that the default helm chart deploys a root chart and a secondary ch chart alongside it so you would have like a shard deployments by default i would say once for now let's leave it as it is until we develop the sharded one but after that we swap it saying like helm chart is the primary way to deploy it is yeah sharded way Secondary way, this is the old version, which deploys everything in one, not intended for production, basically. But I think we should be clear that single shard that everything in one, how it is now in a whole chart, is not very production ready. Yeah, no, no, like I, I just basically meant like the recommended chart by default would be the one that deploys these two things and then Either we keep the single shard one, like maybe it becomes like a sub chart of, of the sharded one, like we I think talked about earlier, um, or we deprecate it in favor of the sharded one and say, hey, you know, this still exists, but please move to, to the sharded one. Okay. I would just deprecate it. I don't think we should give people the chance to shoot themselves in the foot. There's a much better solutions out there. Oh, yeah. Like if you use Helm, you probably want something half production ready somewhere. So for local setup, we can keep the single chart, as Stefan said. Okay, great. Thank you very much for the quick demo and for the update. Is there something else regarding sharding that you would like to discuss? No, I think I suspect there is few bugs left in that code overall, how shards works, but we don't get to those until people start using it. So one of the other reasons why we should try it. If people are interested, this is the PR in the chat. Okay, then thank you very much. Let me actually let me add that link.
to the meeting notes. Okay. Um, do we have any other business? Anything that you would like to discuss that is not on the agenda? Christoph, you have something. I have another beginner question. I recently heard that KCP supports multiple routes. And I tried to find out information on how exactly that would work and what that means. And more importantly, why this is desirable. Can anyone shed some light on how that works? Or where I could find more information? What is a route? A route, a root workspace. Multiple, I was oh, yes. yeah, 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 yeah. one single tree, Basic but apparently it can be yeah. many. Basically, if you if you look for the code which does uh, the user workspaces, there's um, I think they are under users colon and then your name or something like that, and um, users doesn't exist. Basically, it is uh, I think it's just an annotation on your user logical cluster, but there is no parent, and the front proxy reads that information. So if you want to learn about it, read the front proxy code. It will pick that up and basically um, allow you to start at users colon something. Okay. And of course, you can have any kind of root, like you could have something like tenant foo or tenant something. Okay. Understood. Thanks. And then, of course, you um, what you have to do is basically you must be privileged um, to create those virtual clusters. You need some controller which does that, because it's not not um, it's not the workspace controller which can do that work. So you have to do it on your own. Are there technical reasons why I would choose this? Like. Or is this more for organizational? That's just how you want to structure your workspaces. Yeah, the idea is if you have a multi tenancy, it doesn't make sense to have a root. You don't want that, like this visibility you just don't want. Okay. The user should feel like in their own space and has no way to escape. So they can escape in if it was one single tree? Now in theory, you can say, I mean, the, the QCutter plugin would support dot dots and what does it mean? Of course, you don't have access and oh, yeah. the parent, but it's still strange. Okay. And of course, you need you need all those tenants in the root workspace, which is also maybe not what you want. Okay. Maybe you remember was... for for users, um, we had this um, multi-level hierarchy with the initial characters of the name or something like that. You remember that? Is bucketing? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. And this all goes away. You don't need that anymore. And all the logic which creates this uh, bucketing or this hierarchy was very, very tricky and buggy. And now it's just logical class you create. That's it. OK, thank you. And there is a one edge case if you create multiple organizations on the root. And I think in one case you can list them, but you don't have access to them. So you kind of expose to the structure a bit. But yes. Okay. So I have good. one like going on question. So we have now three PRs related to CPU consumption and uh, open API schemas, like none of them are quite ready to merge, but they kind of address uh, addressable issues. So I'm just thinking what, what we should, what we want to do with those. I can talk about my PR. That one, oh, yeah, one of three, 3059. Yeah. Yep. So, uh, in virtual workspaces, we saw that you can't really do open API schema validation on the client side. And that was an effort to enable that. But this also has like some performance implications in terms of if you look at it, 
the PR creates like open API v3 schemas also in the API definition sets, which would result in like double or at least like some fraction of higher CPU usage, uh, sorry, memory usage when you run this. Um, and that's kind of a performance regression in terms of like, a, like virtual workspaces when we are experimenting with them internally, even the open API v2 generation in the create serving info for function creates a lot of memory overhead, which might not be even needed in future. So, TLDR is like, I'm trying to do some experimentation around like, what are the performance implications of running a virtual workspace? And this was also one of the things that I was looking at. Um, on the performance side, I it's it's on my to-do to create like an umbrella issue by running uh, tests on some scale, right? Uh, something like, let's say, 1,000 workspaces and inside them, um, 100 APIs, which are bound to each of those workspaces. Uh, sorry, I'm conflating like two topics, but uh, the scale one came just because I wanted to explain why this, even though it's close to being a feature, feature being ready, but it does have like performance implications if it is merged. Okay, so so I was gonna ask. So this is the uh, PR that adds the Open API schema support um, to the virtual workspace framework. So you talked about that, and you also talked about this PR. Is that right? With the performance implications. Yeah, this is some like we were trying to experiment by running like profiles on like when implementing like virtual workspaces. And we found out this is where the hot code paths that are, um, that come up when we see the memory and the CPU profiles. So the open API, the two proto models is something that we do not necessarily need in create serving info for, um, because that is not used anywhere if you see in the virtual uh, workspace framework, but my understanding may be very limited. Uh, so feel free to enlighten here. Um, there were some other things like if someone is not using the cell validation expressions in custom resources, you can essentially like turn that off and save on creating those cell environments per CRD. Um, and the other thing was the quota controller and the GC controller. Um, I was looking at Andy's presentation from I think one one and a half years ago, where um, Andy describes how he implemented both of these controllers for KCP. Um, we saw like those two controllers also take up like quite a bit of like performance. Hit. But I I think like there are like lots of topics and nuances when talking about scalability. Um, maybe we can discuss that like sometime else. But uh, to be honest, like this PR is like far for completion. This is just a prototype. And if you want to close it, like feel free to close it if uh, it's creating like a management over it in terms of maintenance. It's a good uh, good reminder, I think, of the issues we have. So I would leave it open. Yeah, maybe con convert it okay. to draft, but leave it open. Maybe uh, give it give it a prefix, which makes, uh, makes clear what it is. It's really, I don't know. Uh, can you as a uh, repo owner just, I think you can edit the title to put a WID yeah, yeah. Yeah. in the title? Yeah, we can, we can absolutely yeah. do that. Okay, thank you. I think that, that helps a lot with categorizing this PR. Um, and I think the other one, Stefan, I know you, you were already reviewing it. Um, not sure if there's like more to do, but yeah, th this was the one I, I was describing before. Yep. So, so it's, it, it's I think it's now doable. it's doable, but uh, resource consumption is just too high, right? That's what you. Yeah, Steph, Stefan. Stefan, to be very honest, like it's 
it's call of like KV maintainers at this point because this enables the feature, but it uh, does like some performance regression. So I've tested this like very extensively and it works. Um, but then it does increase in good amount of CPU usage. I mean, we solved it by, we put a hack in our front proxy to redirect all the requests which come to the virtual workspace to the real workspaces. But that's like a hack. And that's where I was asking questions around how can I short circuit uh, that very oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. in the build handler chain punk. OK, so um, should we maybe take that discussion offline, or does it make sense to think about if we want to have this? It, do, do I get this right that the performance impact would be in virtual workspace performance? Because it's the, the component that is being changed, right? Yep. So anyone running a virtual workspace would feel the hit, like in terms of higher memory usage. And sorry, did you did you say like on what, like how much more memory we were talking? Did so uh, the, there is no like concrete number, but if you see that in the create serving info for we already create the OpenAPI v2 models, and since we're creating like in addition OpenAPI v3 models. Uh, I mean, I don't know the exact relation about it, uh, Stefan. Is there some analysis from Kubernetes about this? Because you also talked about in the API machinery session about removing open API v2 altogether. Yeah, kubectl is updated now, so it will use v3 if you have the latest version 129. So v2 should hopefully be phased out soon. I haven't heard anything, I mean, no data or something like that. Formally, so we have one version skew, uh, one version version skew for kubectl. So in theory, when one one thirty is out, one thirty one is out, I think we could remove it. Whether this is done, I don't know. Are we trying to be Kubernetes compatible in the truest sense? If not, maybe we can preemptively remove OpenAPI v two generation and introduce v three. No strong opinion. I think we could do that. I mean, if this is mainly about kubectl, I guess virtual yeah. workspaces are not really that, like, are really meant to be used with kubectl. That was, that was a theory in the beginning. Like, we removed virtual workspaces for, so we had them for um, workspaces at some point to make the filtering. And we got rid of that because of those reasons, because it's virtual workspace is more like best effort. Uh, but I think in, uh, in, in, in your use case, uh, you reintroduce it, right? For filtering. So I think, I think a lot of the things that KCP has introduced as proof of concepts or let's say experimental features. People who are consuming KCP as a library are using them, assuming that it's a production feature. So yeah. that that's like a bold, sharp edge of open sourcing anything. Yeah. So one <laughs> one thirty comes out when exactly Monday the eighth. There was a release cycle start. It's in April, we have it's one thirty. Yeah. So formally, then one could basically remove it when we rebase to one thirty. So maybe unless you would like to get the PR in soon, we were talking about the one dot thirty rebase earlier. So maybe we just basically queue it up until after we have done that. Yeah, I, I don't mind this being uh, open until then. I mean, the, the alternative is if we don't have open API support at the moment at all, wouldn't 
just merging the v3 implementation move us closer to compliance anyway like if we simply don't implement v2 isn't that still a step in the right direction so there's one thing like i did not try implementing v2 because implementing v2 is a little more complicated than v3 um but since the api definition set already has the v2 models we can just do v2 without performance implications like this can be tackled in a separate uh, pr so this adds v3 but adds performance implications by adding like generating more schema on the fly like not on the fly but in memory um but since the v2 scheme already exists uh so in the pr like i have to do's when handling the open api v2 requests so if we just implement the open api v2 handler handlers then v2 support can happen so if kubectl is talking to a virtual workspace it can do the client side validation using v2 but that is going away anyway in 1.30 so it depends on what exactly is what we need from this feature like what's the product direction of kcp get rid of v2 don't invest time okay Fair. okay then we are already over time and i don't want to uh, uh yeah, use any more time than we already have i before we go, is there anything that can't wait maybe for the meeting in two weeks? Something that we need to talk about. Okay, then, MJ? Just uh, maybe think for the next two weeks. Like we got asked yesterday, what's our roadmap? So we need to start thinking about that one, I think. Maybe even a high level, don't need, I think, much details. And so maybe just some ideas. We can think offline and see what we can draft in a high level. So just uh, throwing a stone for people to think when we go for a walk outside. Yep. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Let's talk about uh, like larger, higher level roadmap next time. But if it's on everyone's mind, that will already help. Okay, then again, don't want to take any more time of you all. Thank you very much for attending. I think this was the first time we met this year. Aren't you happy I uh, did not do the Happy New Year thing? Um, have a good day, everyone, evening, night, morning, wherever you are. Um, thank you for joining and talk to you soon. Bye bye. Bye, everyone.